Yo, 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 what up with it? What's good with it? It's the homie Mac, music, art, culture, knowledge, each one, teach one, peace and love. Um, thumbs up, give me the likes, thumbs up, give me the likes, subscribe to the YouTube channel, 82 Kings. You know what it is. Um, yeah, this is another session of Mac and with Mac, book review series. Um, the book I will be reviewing today is The Slave Community by John W. Blassingame. Um, there are different um, versions of this book. I have the, uh, the first release. It was, re it was released by New York Oxford University Press in 1972. Um, yeah, there's, a, there's a, another version where there's a I guess there's more, there's a, I think a couple more chapters added to it. Um, yeah, there's another version that was released uh, some years later, but the original one was released in 1972 by John, John W. Um Again, this book is called The Slave Community, Plantation Life in the Antebellum South. Antebellum South being from 1812 to 1865. Uh, chiefly, the antebellum South is characterized through slavery. Um, I'm sure many of you guys know that. Um, this was a very difficult book to read. I don't think I've ever, aside from maybe reading the Bible, um, I don't think, how do I say this? This was a very hard book to read. Um, I cried a lot. I can't recall ever crying this much reading a book. Uh, this book is done, it's written extremely well. Um, it's very scholarly, John W. Blasting Game, salute to you. Um, from his verbiage, to the use of sources, um, the approach is just very scholarly. Um, spit, excuse me. Um, this book, uh, it brought out a lot of emotion out of me. Um, I guess what I want to get at is uh, essentially, you, you've heard a lot of works about slavery. I've read uh, Frederick Douglass, the, the narrative of a life of Frederick Douglass. Um, you've always had like an overarching, you know, somewhat, um, I guess, cursory look or glance of what slavery was like. You know, people got beat, um, people were stolen, blah, blah, blah. But it's like, this was a very detailed look at slavery from um, just the, the, the characteristics of the plantation, the different personalities that existed on the plantation, the day-to-day -day existence on a plantation, um, the ethos, the culture, the, the zeitgeist, if you will of a plantation in the antebellum south. This book does goes very well into detail about that, what the day-to-day -day was like. Um, and I think what made it more personable was just the, the, the accounts that he got from, you know, former slaves. You know, the literature, the, the resources that he found where slaves, ex-slaves actually, well, enslaved, I don't like to say slaves, the enslaved, um, just spoke about how they felt about their day-to-day -day existence. Um, but let's get to it. The three personalities that were uh, highlighted in this book, the three personalities on, of the enslaved on the plantation, where you had your gnats, gnats, you had the, well, you had the gnats, you had the sambos, and you had the jacks. So Nats, you know, that comes from that time. These were the more recalcitrant, rebellious, aggressive slaves. Um, then you had the Sambos, which were, they were considered the deferentials, the weak, the cowardly, the, the bucking, chucking and jiving. And then you had the Jacks. The Jacks were the hard workers, but they were somewhat rebellious. Um, the thing that's interesting is a lot of times the, the Sambos, you know, they actually were rebellious. A lot of times they played a role, they thought, okay, you want me to play this role? 
Uh, you want me to be deferential? You want me to be uh, weak and fearful? I'll play that role because it makes you feel comfortable around me, but the whole time I'm plotting. So that was a, that, the, the, this book espoused that uh, characteristic trait of a Sambo. And I always thought Sambos were just weak and cowardly. And that's not always the case. A lot of Sambos ran away. Um, one of the things that they talked about in this, in this uh, book was pretty much how you had, you had a situation where there was even classism and division amongst white people in the sense of you had the overseer, the master, and then the, 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 um, the plant, what do they call it, the planter. Um, and a lot of times they were in conflict for power, for power amongst each other. Um, a lot of the overseers were characterized as lazy. Um, a lot of the masters were actually lazy naturally you got everybody else doing your work um, and there was a lot of plant there was a lot of pressure on the overseer and there was always like a a power struggle in the sense of the overseer friend feeling like I have to instill fear I have to make sure these slaves do my bidding um, and a lot of times you know sla you know slaves would rebel the enslaved would rebel by tearing up equipment not working, um, things of that nature. Everything wasn't always this big, massive, uh, you know, rebellion. Sometimes it would be subtle rebellions, things that would just make the operation more difficult. Things that the slave would do, the slaves would do to make the operation more difficult on the plantation. Um, I think the thing that's really interesting about this book is. It pretty much talks about at the end of the day, people wanted to survive. It was all about survival. Some people were Nats, some people were Sambos, and the people would always say, or Jacks as well, some people would always say, couldn't have been me. If I was on a plantation, I would have been da 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 da. Man, shut up. You don't know what you would have did on a plantation. Because at the end of the day, you want to survive. You're not trying to get whipped and beat. Um, one of the things I thought was pretty interesting about this book is it talks about how some of the masters actually did not want their slaves to go to church because um, the story of Moses, Exodus, it actually inspired some people to rebel. The, the, the desire to want to be free, not nominally free, but free literally. You know, and I always thought that was interesting because it was always as if religion has been the tool to oppress and not as a tool of liberation. Whereas even some masters felt like, to an extent, religion was actually a tool of liberation and rebellion, revolution. Um, so they didn't want their uh, slaves going to church, reading about Moses, reading about uh, different things of that nature. Um, one of the things I thought was interesting is this book also talks about how things are quoted in the Bible, but certain things aren't quoted. Like it's a quoted, slaves obey your masters, but it also, uh, there's another quote, I can't, I don't know if I can find it in this book. I highlighted it somewhere. But essentially it says how um, there's, there's, a, there's an onus, there's a responsibility on the master to treat their slaves well. And, you know, um, one of the things that this book kind of showed me was just like, um, not kind of showed me, but really, um, I guess elucidated for me, made more clear, was just the fact that A lot of slaves, they took, they, 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 re, they realized like, you have my body, but you don't have my mind. And a lot of times the, the enslaved, you know, they had a sense of family, they looked out for each other. Um, when they were in, in the slave quarters amongst each other, you know, they, they, they breathed life into one another. Spiritually, psychologically, they kept each other going. Um, let me see, uh, and at one point it talks about how the slaves were, it was, they were literally beat into submission, they were beat, and it was beat into them the white superiority, and the thing that I thought was interesting how, uh, some of the slaves were like, we knew that wasn't true because we saw poor white people, we saw poor white people that wealthy white people crapped on. And another thing that I thought was it kind of caught me off guard, it was pretty interesting. I remember Frederick Douglass saying how 
slaves would fight each other over, over who had a better master. And I used to wonder, like, why would that be? But then, in this book, it kind of showed me, like, look, some people were actually treated better because of their master, because their master had <clears throat> a certain amount of wealth and prestige. Um, one thing I did not know, there's a lot of, lot, this book got my mind going everywhere, so I apologize if it seems like I'm jumping around. But uh, one thing I did not know is that we have maroons in America. A maroon, you know, I always thought maroons was something that was just unique to the Caribbean slave experience. And it wasn't. It, we had maroons in America. A maroon basically being someone who rebelled from the plantation, rebelled from a Western way of living. And they pretty much escaped and started their own little communities separate from the plantation. And a lot of times um, they were attacked. Sometimes they won. Sometimes they were defeated and were sent back to slavery. But um, some of the slave masters were just like, you know what, it's, it's, we're wasting resources trying to get them to come back to the plantation. Just stay over there, do your thing, live amongst each other. I didn't know that existed. Um, another thing that I thought was interesting was uh, the relationships between men and women, black men and black women. How some of the slave masters would actually let, the, would let their slaves enslave, would let the enslaved get married. Um, Another thing I thought was kind of sad, though, a lot of a lot of the men did not want to get married because they're like, why would I want to marry a woman when I know that I can't protect her? I, can, I you know, if she's getting beat, um, if she's being harassed, if she's being raped, there's literally nothing I can do because they, they're going to kill me, <laughs> you know, and I can't imagine how depressing that is. And I can't. And, and one thing I'm wondering is epigenetically, how is that resonating in our DNA today? The relationships between black men and black women, be it romantic or just being in community with one another. And because you're witnessing so much trauma, you're seeing people get beat, you're seeing people's heads get cut off and put on a spike, uh, you're just seeing all these inhumane, torturous things, people being maimed. Um, you had some people who were slaves who, some men who actually, they were, if they did marry, they would want to marry a woman that lived on another plantation because they felt as though... Um, at least I don't, I don't have to be with her day to day. So if she gets beat, I may not, you know, I don't have to worry about seeing it. She doesn't have to worry about seeing me get beat and tortured. Um, and then I think some people, some of the men were afraid, and women too, were afraid to have m m marriages or relationships because there's a fear that we, they were going to be taken away. You're going to take my lover away. You're going to take them to another plantation. You're going to take them somewhere further away from where we are. You're going to separate our family. Um, and I know that definitely has done, done a number on the enslaved and their descendants psychologically. They said some one woman, um, it's noted in this book, they took away her lover and she was so despondent and depressed, she drowned herself. Um, this book gets ugly. Um, but the thing that I thought was interesting was how uh, back to religion, like a lot of the, you know, there were Christians a lot of the slaves, the enslaved, they found hope in the Bible. They found hope in, you know, the, the, I'm in service to God. You know, I'm enslaved, but I'm in service to God. God is going to get me through this. Um, I thought that that was very telling, the level of faith that a lot of them had. Um, and then, you know, some of them, they just were in a perpetual despondent state. They just kind of accepted this is my faith. It's not going to get any better. So I just have to keep my mind and my wits about myself however I can. I have to seek gratification from my family, from my loved ones, and the community that I exist uh, in. Um, let me see. One of the things that I thought was pretty interesting is a lot of times we've always kind of made these blanket universal remarks about plantations, and every plantation was not the same. Um, quote in the book, in spite of the institution defined roles, the treatment of the slaves varied from plantation to plantation. One of the most important institutions which influenced the planter's treatment of the slave was the white family. The white child grew up in a society which stressed formalized courtship, romanticized women as angelic, made a fetish of the family, frowned on public displays of affection, encouraged prolific childbearing, and promoted early marriages. The planter's family was patriarchal, deeply religious, and filiopeistic. <coughs> Males were 
giving religious and moral lessons as well as being taught to be aggressive, aggressive, proud, independent, courteous, courageous, chivalrous, honorable, and intelligent. So that kind of lets you know, I know I'm kind of sipping gears, but that kind of lets you know just the culture of the plantation, uh, especially as far as white people, um, how they were reared, I guess. Um, let me see, let me find some other quotes in this book. Um, he talks about Nat Turner here. I like this. He said, uh, "Having this is Nat Turner. Having soon discovered to be great, I must appear so, and therefore I studiously avoided mixing in society and wrapped myself in mystery, devoting my time to fasting and prayer. From his prayers, I'm reading about what Nat said. From his prayers and fasts and revelations from the Lord, Nat was convinced. He declared that I was ordained for some great purpose in the hands of the Almighty. Several things confirmed this for him. Upon reaching manhood, he recalled vividly that both whites and blacks during his childhood had often said that I had too much sense to be raised. And if I was, I would never be of any use to anyone as a slave. Apparently, Nat's discontent with slavery was inspired by his father, who managed to escape. When Nat was placed under a new overseer, he too ran away, but returned to the plantation after remaining in the woods for 30 days. His fellow slaves were dismayed at his voluntary return saying, if they had my sense, they would not serve any master in the world. Mm. Yeah, so uh, this book, I encourage people to get their hands on it. Um, I don't know if any book review can do this book justice. You have to read this for yourself. You have to digest this, process it for yourself. Um, this book has definitely had a, um, an impact on my paradigm. Um, I also want to talk, I'm going to talk about this, we know it existed, um, quoting from the book, the white man's lust for black women was one of the most serious impediments to the development of morality. The white man's pursuit of black women frequently destroyed any possibility that comely black girls would remain chaste for long. Few slave, slave